so I don't want to talk about the internet today. Um, actually, I'd like to talk about culture. I think for all of us who work with the internet, the most important question we need to be asking ourselves now is not what kind of company am I going to create next, or what kind of algorithm, or what kind of platform. I think the really important question is what kind of culture will the company or platform that I create next, what kind of culture will that platform create? So that's what I really want to talk about today. How do we engineer and scale the kind of culture and behavior that we want to see in the world? So let's get into that. So what is culture? So when we think about a culture, a society, or a group of people, really when you get down to it, it's a, it's a collection of subcultures. It's a collection of smaller ideas. And the, the best definition of subculture I've ever seen came from this guy, uh, William Gibson. So the idea of a subculture is it's essentially an experiment. It's somewhere where the industrialized world goes to dream, is, is how we put it. Unconscious R&D. Um, and I've been fascinated with subcultures my entire life. I, I grew up in London, and I was really, really into the subculture of, of pirate radio. Um, I listened to it from when I was a little kid, and look, I was a good kid at school. I didn't get in a lot of trouble, but I had to get involved with pirate radio as, as soon as I was basically big enough to lift a box of records. Um, so pirate radio, I'm sure a lot of you know what it is. For those of you that don't, um, there's lots of illegal radio stations that run all over the world simply because a bunch of kids put a scaffolding pole on the top of a tower block with duct tape and connected it to some turntables. If you do that in a city like London, you can reach millions and millions of people um, for about 300 pounds worth of equipment, which isn't very much. So uh, I, used to, I used to go up on the tower blocks and DJ every weekend. I was very involved in a, a lot of important subcultures that came out of the UK. Um, UK Garage, Grime, Dubstep, uh, was some of the scenes that I was very involved in. And the thing that fascinated me about the technology was it was really resilient, right? The police were trying to catch us, and they could find our antennas and knock them down, but the, the antenna was connected via infrared to the studio, so they could never find the studio. So they, you know, they, would, um, they would always be trying to catch us, but the thing that really interested me about Pirate Radio was it was actually good for the community that I was part of. It was a value add to British culture. It created new forms of music. It was a way to be of service. It was something good for society. So the police, they were trying to catch us every weekend, but the pirate station that I played on, Ice FM, was so big that they also used to advertise with us. That's when you know you're adding, that's when you know you've achieved product market fit, right? So, so I was part of these cultures, and um, I started a music magazine with some other guys called Rewind in the UK to really document all of the subcultures that were growing from pirate radio. Uh, I think Rewind is still the largest music magazine by circulation in the UK, but we, we got lucky with it. It was the right idea at the right time. Um, and after Rewind, I decided I wanted to look at this more. I, I wrote a book called The Pirate's Dilemma, where I really just wanted to examine how do subcultures happen, and how do they then sort of go on to shape the world in interesting, in interesting ways. Um, so I went back and I looked at the history of some other subcultures that happened before I was born, and just started to get really fascinated with how other people had done things in, in other parts of the world. So take this guy, for example. This man's name is Richard Hell. Um, he grew up in New York, and he was very active in the early 70s. And he was really just, he was really pissed off with the culture around him. He was really frustrated by glam rock and just everything on television and hippies with long hair. Like all of this, he just, it was, he didn't like it. Um, and he was influenced by French poets like Rimbaud and Artaud here, and how they cut their hair up all, all messy. So he cut his hair up the same way, and he cut his clothes up, and he wrote phrases on his clothes like rip it up and start again. And he couldn't play a guitar, but he started a band anyway, and he started playing on Sunday nights at a club called CBGB. And then other bands started copying him. His band was called Voidoids and then Television. And then we had the Ramones, we had Debbie Harry, and then Malcolm McLaren took Richard Hell's whole look and started a boy band in the UK called the Sex Pistols. And before we know it, it's 1977 and punk has exploded. But the ideas behind punk, that you could just pick up a guitar and do it, and it didn't matter. I'm sure half the people in this room picked up a computer before they knew anything about how to code or how to build an internet site and just decided that we could do it anyway. That idea was really transmitted to the world 
through punk of just doing, doing everything yourself. Take this guy, this is another guy, again in New York in the 70s, his name was David Mancuso. So David, I was lucky enough to call a friend, he passed away last year, but this man was more of a mentor to me in terms of thinking about how we build things than, than anybody in the world. So David had this very clear idea in the, in the late 60s, he decided that he wanted to start this party and he wanted this dance floor where everybody was welcome, black people, white people, Hispanic people, gay people, straight people. He wanted to create a safe space where everybody could be together on the dance floor at the same time, homeless people, movie stars. He knew all of these people. He was a, he was a, a real character in New York. And he had this very specific vision for how this party should look. It should have balloons all across the ceiling and streamers, and there needed to be a fridge in the corner and a table with food on it because not everybody there had, had a meal that day and he wanted everybody to feel welcome and everybody to eat food together and just, and just see that we were all the same. And then there was a big punch bowl laced with uh, LSD punch um, and everybody drank it and these parties would go on every, every day, every week, sometimes for 48 hours. The party was called Love Saves the Day. The club was called The Loft. Um, he started playing this really weird mix of world music and early electro and, and weird sort of B-sides of rock records. And people started calling the music that David played disco. Um, there was a guy called Larry Levan who uh, was one of David's protégés at The Loft. And he left and started a club called The Paradise Garage, which is where the word garage music comes from. Another guy, Frankie Knuckles, on the end here, used to operate the lights at The Loft. He moved to Chicago, started a club called The Warehouse Club, which was, again, kind of a, a blueprint of The Loft. And that's where the term house music comes from. And what David tried to do here and the way he tried to, his whole thing since before he started, he had this vision and he knew it was from somewhere in his childhood. He had this idea of a really happy time and he couldn't quite remember what it was from. But he's like, we need social progress through music and I know how to do it. And that's what he did. And if you look at everything that happened after the loft in electronic music, this is a very incomplete sketch, this diagram. Um, but every type of music and everything from the Berlin Love Parade to the Electric Daisy Carnival, it's the same message. It's love and it's unity and it's we're all the same and everybody's okay and everybody's welcome. And that idea came from this one club. It's really crazy, the, the power of a good idea. And just to illustrate quite how crazy that was, this wasn't David's idea. So this is the loft in the 70s. It's this huge thing in New York. Everybody knows where it is. Disco exploded after it. Um, but there was this, this kid in upstate New York who remembered who David was because he had been in this home for wayward children and runaway kids with David when they were both five years old and had pictures of this, this orphanage they were at and this time in their lives. And he came to New York and he, he tracked David down and he met him and he brought this stack of photos of the orphanage they used to be in. And the way David would tell me this story is this, this, this guy came into the loft holding this photo and he just froze. And David, it was the daytime, the loft was empty, and David walks over to him, and this guy is like, he's pale and he's shaking, and he just hands David this photo of this room in this orphanage. And in this room, there's balloons all across the ceiling, and there's a fridge in the corner, and there's a punch bowl on the table, and there's food on the table, and there's all these kids, and they're from all different backgrounds, all these wayward kids, different races, and there's a nun at the back of the room with her hands in the air going, dance, dance, dance. And David tracked this nun down. Her name was Sister Alicia. I was lucky enough to meet her before she passed. She, this was her idea. She understood the spiritual power of sound. She ran this orphanage for kids who would beat each other with sticks and were really nasty to each other. And she understood that if she got them to play music together and dance together, then they all got on and they all behaved and they all identified with each other a lot more. And this nun in 1940s upstate New York literally affected the entire history of dance music. That's how powerful a really, really good idea is. That's, that's really what creating a platform is about to me. So I, I kind of look at all these subcultures and you, you can see this kind of formula. Like somebody has a crazy idea, a radical idea, Sister Alicia, Dave Mancuso, and they put that idea in the world somehow. It can be a venue, it can be the loft, it can be the party room at the orphanage, it can be a pirate radio station, a mixtape, a video. It doesn't matter, a piece, a piece of media that other people then can relate to. And if it does inspire other people and validates how they feel, both at the individual and group level, people will respond to it and they'll start adding to that narrative 
and so it will go on, and that's sort of how these subcultures start. So it's, it's about inspiring people, it's about user-generated content, bringing others into the narrative, and kind of keeping that cycle going. But then something started to happen in the 80s and 90s. All, all these vibrant youth cultures that, that came out of New York in the 70s and other places. In the 80s and 90s, marketers started realizing, well, if we attach products to these cultures, we can sell kids things. And that's what they did. And, and now these subcultures kind of don't work in the same way. And also the media networks, the way we transmit them, are, are very, very different. So let me show you what I mean by that. Let's take the other big subculture that came out of New York in the 70s. 11th August 1973, Cedric Avenue Rec Room, DJ Cool Herc throws the first ever party. The, the birth of hip hop is literally this, this event on this flyer. It's the first time that he played uh, the break sections from disco records together, and kids started doing this new type of dancing called break dancing. So that's how that subculture was transmitted on that handwritten piece of paper that he made himself and handed out to people in his neighborhood. So what's interesting to me about hip hop when you look at it, hip hop had, had it, this was 1973, so fast forward to 1979. This is, the first, this is the first time you had people rapping on vinyl. So hip hop didn't even go downtown for six years, never mind leave New York. It had time to really incubate and figure out what it, what it was. And people like Grandmaster Flash and Africa Bambada in the Bronx saw hip hop as a culture they could use to, to get people to come together the same way Sister Alicia did in the party room. And they, they stopped the gangs in the Bronx from fighting. And, and hip-hop was really able to develop into this really, like, really interesting subculture, which has these five elements, DJing, MCing, break, breaking, um, graffiti. And the fifth and most important element that people kind of tend to forget was social progress. Like This was something baked into hip-hop in the Bronx from the start that's really part of it, and I, I think one of the reasons that hip-hop is still you know, the most vibrant form of youth, youth culture that we have today is because it just has these really deep foundations. So fast forward to 2015, so there's an, another dance craze happens, like breakdancing, the dab, right? But this is how it's communicated. Look at, look at how it's, it's put out to the world. Here's this new thing. Share it, tweet it, email it to your friends, put it on Reddit. Spread it as, as far as you can, as quickly as you can. If you start doing that with a subculture, before you know it, Hillary Clinton is doing your dance on The Ellen Show, and it's never going to be a powerful social movement, right? It's done. It's over. It's the worst thing in the world. Um, so yeah, we, we've started to really pick these, these, these subcultures, and they're not subcultures anymore. They're memes that travel over these networks that we've created. And it struck me that these networks have become more powerful than subcultures. And, and that was maybe, maybe not a good thing. And you know, I was scratching my head and thinking about this um, when I had the opportunity to meet the CEO of BitTorrent. And I'm sure, a lot, does everybody in this room know what BitTorrent is? OK, yes, you, you, by, the, by the guilty murmurings, I can tell you've all used our product. Um, so everybody knows what BitTorrent is. And, and I looked at this, and I thought it was fascinating for two reasons, the same way Pirate Radio was. One, it's super resilient. 30 to 40% of the world's internet traffic moves over this protocol. There is no better way to send a large file across an asymmetric network like the internet um, than BitTorrent. It's used by the human genome sequencer and the Large Hadron Collider and Facebook and Twitter and all sorts of people. It is essentially the internet's answer to the AK-47. It just works. It doesn't break. It doesn't matter what you do to it. So it's a really cool, it's a really cool core technology. Um, but then the other thing that I found interesting about, that's BitTorrent on the protocol, but the thing that interested me about BitTorrent on the company was there was 170 million people using it every month to steal Game of Thrones. And given what I knew about people who listen to pirate radio and how passionate they are, and the, the people who will go to the extra lengths to find things, which are BitTorrent users, well, those are people you can, those are people you can use to or you can connect with and, and, and connect with artists and connect with filmmakers and create new cultures. It struck me that this was a place where maybe we could create a new subculture within BitTorrent that actually worked for artists and worked for filmmakers. So I joined BitTorrent in two, the end of 2011. And for my first year there, I, kind of, I did a lot of experiments with different artists and just would put different albums and, and films and things in front of our user base in a bunch of different ways just to kind of figure out what 
what makes sense here? Like, what kind of subculture should we build here? Should we build a store like iTunes? Should we build a streaming service? Like, what do people want to happen here? And I, I really learned the value of when you've got a big user base that's very passionate, you have to go with the grain of that network. You can't just shove something down their throats that doesn't make any sense with the rest of the product. You have to build something that works within the context of, of the world that you're, you're operating in. Um, and so we came up with this idea, we, we weren't going to build a content store because that wasn't how BitTorrent worked. Files needed to be shared everywhere. Like Whatever we built, that had to be true. So instead of putting content in a store, we built this new file type called a BitTorrent bundle where you could actually put a store inside a piece of content. So you could share a song, but there was always a link back to the artist's web page or a store inside the content where you could buy a t-shirt or a concert ticket or the rest of the album or the rest of the film or something. But the other important thing about BitTorrent Bundle was it was kind of up to the artist as to how they monetize their work. The, the more artists and filmmakers that we worked with, we realized that there wasn't one good business model for digital content. There was, in fact, a different business model for every piece of digital content on the internet, depending on who the artist was trying to reach. So. The way bundle files work is you can, you can have all these different gates. You can have no gate at all, and all the content can be free. Or you can ask for an email address to get some of the content. Or you can ask someone to pay a fixed price. Or you can have people pay whatever it is that they like. And we thought this was a really good idea. And we thought, OK, this is great. Like The music industry and the film industries are going to thank us and like, give us a Nobel Prize or something because we fixed everything. Uh, and it was not the case. Um, none of the major labels would work with us or turn our phone calls or anything. Uh, we, we launched our first bundle with Cascade as, as an independent artist with some stuff he had sort of outside of his label deal. And it went really well, but just it fell on dead ears. People would, just did not want to work with us. Um, this is a quote from the, the head of Sony Pictures Classics. Um, this is what, something he said about me after I appeared at the Variety Film Summit with him. He's like, These, this guy should be in jail uh, for what he's doing, which, you know, I, that didn't feel good. Um, this guy, his name's Todd Brown. He's a filmmaker from Canada. He literally challenged me to a fight in a boxing ring at a film festival because he was so angry that I was trying to say, maybe there's some value inside the BitTorrent ecosystem. Um, so, yeah, you know, people wanted to beat us up and throw us in prison, so that kind of sucked. Um, but look, one thing I learned from, from people like David and Sister Alicia and just listening to all these stories was, you know, if you, if you hit someone with a radical idea, you're going to get pushback, and you just got to keep going. If you really believe that you're being of service and you're putting something good in the world, just, just keep trying to prove it to people. And the good thing about the internet is you have data. So we had all this data coming in. We could see all these conversion rates on bundles, and they were insane. Like, BitTorrent users are a voracious consumers of content, and if they find something they will like, they will go the extra mile to find every single thing they can about that, that content creator. Um, so, I mean, just to give those some context to these numbers, the average banner ad on the internet, a good conversion rate or an average conversion rate is 0.1%. So anything above 2% is fantastic. So we were seeing all these great numbers, and then when we did surveys and we talked to these users, I mean, these people just bought so much content. And they, they went to BitTorrent not because they didn't like buying content, they went there to get the stuff they couldn't buy or they couldn't find, the real heavy, heavy consumers of content. So we, we started spreading these numbers and talking to artists about it. And we built a platform where the back-end data that the artists saw, because BitTorrent's a decentralized network and doesn't have a, a central hub, if you uploaded a bundle there and people downloaded it from you, you would see all these amazing stats that we at BitTorrent HQ wouldn't see. So. Um, this was really from talking to artists. The Grateful Dead's manager once said to me the only way he got, he got the real numbers from his record label um, was to sue them. And if you talk to filmmakers about trying to get data out of Netflix, it's like getting blood out of a stone. People don't give people data in the content industry. So we made a point of saying this data should belong to you. And, and we did that in a bunch of ways. And we, we told our, our consumers the same thing. And we managed to annoy the NSA as well as the record labels, which was probably a worse idea. Um, but this started to resonate with people. People started to understand, OK, these guys are trying to do something different. And, and one person that really saw the value in what we're trying to do, um, or I should say a group of people, was the guys from Radiohead. And we worked with them uh, for about, we started talking to them, and it, the process, the whole thing took about two years. But 
Tom York ended up recording an album in secret um, called Tomorrow's Modern Boxes, which we released as the first paid for BitTorrent bundle. And this was kind of the watershed moment for bundle. Um, 4.5 million people downloaded this, this album. It was one of the most successful albums of 2014. Um, it broke the internet the day it came out. And that really started to, to help us get to more people. After this, the majors did slowly start working with us, and eventually we worked with, with all of them, plus some of the biggest independent artists in the world, from Moby to Madonna. And even a lot of the film studios and really important filmmakers like Michel Gondry and Joshua Oppenheimer saw the value in what we're doing and started working with us. Uh, and then at the end of 2014, something, something else happened. So the Sony Pictures got hacked um, over this film, The Interview. The North Koreans were very upset about it. And they didn't want to show this anywhere. They were worried that movie theaters were going to get blown up and there was no safe way to distribute this because there was always a central place that could be you know, bombed or whatever. So we went back to Sony Pictures, even after they said that we should be in jail. And we said, look, we'll help, look, we can help you with this. And it was, again, be of service, like do good. It doesn't matter what people say about you. If your idea is good and your platform's good, they're going to give you shit at first. Just keep doing good and keep doing the right thing. And that's what we did. And we talked to them about how to release it. And after that, Sony Pictures started working with us and they started distributing films with us. Um, even this guy, Todd Brown, remember him, who, who challenged me to a boxing match at a film festival? Well, I accepted his challenge. I beat him by TKO in round two. <laughs> and yeah, it was great. I love boxing. You, you got to take up boxing. Um, it was really fun, but the really fun thing was the training and the getting to know Todd actually during that process and understanding a bit more about why he felt the way he did about BitTorrent. And I was able to understand his perspective a bit more and he was able to understand ours. And the real win for me was Todd released his next film as a BitTorrent bundle. He, he came around, he saw what we were doing and it had nothing to do with the physical violence. Um, he, he just he wanted to do this of his own accord. So we, we, we managed to do something at BritTorrent sort of based on these principles of doing good and sh being transparent with data and just, just trying to be of service to people and really thinking about the culture that we were in. Um, and, and we started to see good things. The, the RIAA sent me a nasty letter um, in 2015 saying, in 2014 they'd seen 1.6 million illegal downloads of their members' work on BitTorrent and we really should be doing more about it, which, look, you know, that's, that's 1.6 million illegal downloads. But uh, I, I responded to them and said, well, guys, last year via Bundle, we recorded a quarter of a billion legal downloads of people downloading content from artists in a way that directly benefited them. So you're welcome? I don't know. Um, but that was cool, right? We, we managed to do something. We managed to change the culture within this ecosystem. And... Um, I'd never really worked at a tech company before that, and I learned a lot about technology and, and how you build these loops and these game mechanics into, into things to, to keep people coming back and keeping people engaged. And I'm sure a lot of you in this room are familiar with building in hooks and loops. And I, I really like this example from a book called Hooked by Nia Ale. He has this, this, this diagram. You, you have a trigger, like you, know, you get a notification. Somebody's commented on your photos. So you take an action. You open the app where the comment was, and you get a variable reward. You read the comment, and it's different from the last comment you got. You know there's always going to be a different reward when you open it. And then you will invest. Maybe you'll like that comment or you'll comment back, and that triggers the whole thing again, right? The other person gets a notification that you liked their thing, and, and so on and so forth, until you're absolutely addicted to that app. Um, well, it struck me that I'd seen this diagram before, right? This is the same way that we build narrative threads in subcultures. Somebody throws out a cool idea, a, a trigger, others take action, they get a variable reward, they're somehow inspired, and they become a fan or an artist or a music journalist, and they invest in that subculture, and, and round and round it goes. And, and that was when it really occurred to me that you know, all these new social networks, they're not, they're not killing subcultures, they are subcultures. When you think about it, they follow the same pattern. There's always a, a really like, you know, weird idea at the beginning, like a protest almost, like Snapchat, was I don't want my parents to see me sending nude photos to other kids on my campus. Um, or Instagram was let's democratize photography. Or YouTube was the same idea behind punk. TV is boring, let's do something else instead. They scratch this itch, they, they have this idea, they spread via user-generated content and game mechanics, 
And the really smart ones do what hip hop did, and that's they build a deep foundation and a deep community, and they monetize very, very late in the game when they really understand their users and what they're really about. Um, and, it, and it started to occur to me that, well, if, if these social networks that we're building, these new networks are subcultures, we should start to be deliberate about how we build them and the things that we decide to build. And the, we, should think, we should think about the ramifications of that. Um, so last year, I started a new lab. Uh, it's called 1-800-Nothing. It's uh, financed by one of the movie studios. I'm not allowed to say which one. The reason for the obscure name is we, we want to be able to make things and not have it connected back to the parent company. Um, but it's cool. We've got a lot of resources to go and do some, some crazy things. And we've done a lot of fun things over the last year or so. But we always sort of come at it with this, this purpose. So we always think about how do we, can we use game mechanics to help people play, connect, and create a scale. Um, that's kind of the basis of what we do. But with everything we make, we, we try and approach a problem in society and see if we can come up with some kind of solution to it through, through, through social networking. Um, so one of the problems that we noticed was news media it was really running on feelings rather than facts last year when we, we kind of started the lab. And this was happening everywhere you looked, right? So this is a guy called Michael Gove, who was very involved in the Brexit, the Brexit stuff in the UK. And he, he had this quote, he said, Britain has had enough of experts, that, which, which I read that and I was kind of horrified by that, but it struck me that he was right. Like people really don't care. They've really tuned out anybody who's considered an expert in anything. Um, Newt Gingrich said the same thing in the US before the 2016 election, he said, um, he was uh, having a debate with uh, this newscaster about crime figures, and he said, "Well, people are angry because they feel because of crime." And she said, "Well, wait, crime is down." And he said, "Yeah, but people feel like it's up. So you go with the theoreticians, but I'll go with how people really feel. That's scary, right? If people just feel something's bad and actually it's completely divorced from reality, you know, th these are the things that that were worrying us. And so, okay, well." How do you how do you um, how do you create a solution for something like this? We're at social networks where facts don't matter. Well, can we create a social network that rewards people for being objectively factually correct? Now, I don't know about you guys, but that sounds like the most boring social network <laughs> that I can imagine. Um, but we started thinking more on this and, and looking around at other forms of media, traditional media, and actually there are examples of platforms in traditional media where you're rewarded for being objectively, factually correct, right? The game show. This is a format that works in every country in the world and has done for decades. People love game shows. They love being right on TV in front of other people. So we thought, well, maybe there's something here. What if we created a, a kind of game show app where people could upload their own questions and answers and become their own game show hosts and the most popular people would be the people with the best questions and answers. Because then what you get is actually something where you've got to be right in a game show, right? So we create this app called Trivia Hero. Uh, it's in the App Store right now in the US. It's appealing mostly to 15 to 24 year old women. It has all the narcissism of Snapchat, but with the objectivity of the associated press. Because you need to be right, right? You need to have a good question and be good on camera. But if you're wrong, other people are going to report you and get mad at you and, and flag your question. And it's going to go away. So hopefully, you know, maybe this is an answer. It's one experiment. We're running a lot of different ones. Um, another thing, I mean, I, I don't have to go over this with you guys. Everybody knows how much digital media has just been dividing the world in the, in the last couple of years. And, and it, you know, we get into these really horrible arguments with people on the internet as a result. We've all been there, right? You go on Twitter, you make some offhand comment about something you saw in the news, and before you know it, all these people you don't know are attacking you and calling you names, right? Like this poor guy, Donald, I've no idea who he is. Um, so th this is, to me, this looks like, this is like bare knuckle fighting in a back alley, right? We fight with each other all over the internet, like the kids with sticks at Sister Alicia's orphanage. Like we are, untrained, immature imbeciles on the internet. And we've all called our auntie's best friend a name about some political issue. We've all done that on Facebook or YouTube and everybody's been there. So it struck us that we needed to create a place for people to argue on the internet. Because there isn't, we need to create a place where people can have a fair fight. We needed to create a boxing ring. So we created this app, it's called Bout That. And you can go there and you can create a debate 
and someone can accept your challenge and debate you, and then you've got 90 seconds where you're, you're both live streaming, looking at each other, and you debate back and forth, and the audience can watch you, and they can comment, and they can tap on one side, or they can tap on the other, and the winner is the person with the most votes at the end of 90 seconds. So it's a very, very simple debate format. So two, two things kind of occurred to us when we, when we made this. One was this could turn into the absolute worst place on the internet. Just a horrible armpit of shouting and misogyny and the wor just the worst kind of people on the internet might come here. But the thing we were secretly hoping was actually it wouldn't. And actually because people were looking each other in the eye, even though they were on opposite sides of an issue, maybe they'd start to see that they weren't so different. Maybe I see you and I'm like, oh, you're sitting in your kitchen. It looks a bit like my kitchen. And I guess you're a human being just like me. So maybe I won't call you a name and maybe I will hear you out. And maybe I'll be a bit nicer to you because I know that actually other people are watching right now as well. And so far, that's really kind of borne out. We haven't seen the kind of debates that people are creating um, are actually, for the most part, pretty good. Like We don't have a lot of filtering in there and we have had to do very, very light moderating. It's working pretty well. We're getting sort of good engagement numbers. About 10% of the people are creating content. 90% of the people just want to watch other people bow, which is that sort of 90-10 ratio you see on a lot of platforms that are based on user-generated content. It's kind of working. So we're going to expand this a lot next year. We're going to put it on a lot of other live streaming platforms. It's in the app in the US App Store right now. Um, it will be on Twitch before the end of this year and Facebook Live next year and then worldwide next year and we're really hoping that we can scale empathy and we can get people to have more constructive arguments through about that because David Mancuso was right. We need to cre create dance floors that all of us can get on and that we can all see each other no matter how different that actually we're more the same. And Richard Hell was right. We need to keep ripping things up and forget about the old rules and old metrics, start again. And the most important thing as Cool Herc said was social progress. Bake social progress into the platforms you build next, because that's how we're going to really push things forward. Thank you very much. <clears throat>